Well, good morning. Welcome to White Plains. My name is Gary, and I joyfully serve as the senior pastor here. And I want to, if you're new to us, I want to say a special welcome to you. Thank you for being with us this morning. I hope that you find our uh, church to be a warm and welcoming group of people as our guest. I want you to know I've been praying for you. You are an answer to prayer this week. I've been praying for you and your families, and I'm thankful you're here uh, this morning. If you're considering a church home, I would hope that uh, White Plains could be that church you could call home. Thank you again for being with us. For those of us, for those of y'all who are relatively new to White Plains, I want to let you know of something that we're starting, a new thing that we're starting uh, on May 7th. It'll be right after church, and it will be in the kitchen, which is the room right behind you. Uh, if, you're, if you're relatively new to the church, uh, I would invite you to come to this uh, reception called Get to Know White Plains. And it's a, just a, it's a brief time together. We'll have some refreshments and a chance for you to get to know me and some of our staff. If you've got questions about ministries and different things about the church, that's a really good opportunity for you to, uh, to use to, uh, to, to talk and, and uh, ask those questions. Uh, because we're going to have some refreshments, if you are interested in coming to that, I would uh, ask that you RSVP by using the blue communication card there in front of you. If you just put in Get to Know White Plains on the bottom there and, and put that uh, in the black box on your way out or drop it off at the Welcome Center uh, or the Welcome Desk, that would be helpful. So thank you. Kids, it's always good seeing you here at church. Uh, last week, during Kids Church, uh, do you remember what you learned about? Do you remember the guy's name who talked to Jesus at night? You remember? Nicodemus. He was a religious leader who met with Jesus at night, in the dark, to ask Jesus some questions. And Jesus answered those questions, but in the answering of those questions, Nicodemus got more confused. And so to help Nicodemus understand what Jesus was talking about, he says this in John 3.16. Maybe you know this verse, but Jesus says to Nicodemus, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Kids, God loves you so much that he gave you his only son. If you believe in Jesus, if you believe that Jesus is who Jesus says he was, the Bible says that you will live forever with him. That is some really good news. Only God can love like that. And God loves you like that. If you have questions about the way God loves you and how much God loves you, I would encourage you to talk to your uh, kids' church teacher. You could talk to me. You could talk to your parents or grandparents. It is so good to be loved by God. Thank you, kids, for being here with us this morning. I will dismiss you all on over to kids' church. So if you want to get up and go to the lobby, uh, they will escort you over to the chapel. Kids' church is for kids in kindergarten through sixth grade. And after, um, after church is over, you can pick them up on the, at the back door of the chapel. The building will be locked and secured as soon as they get over there. So we're going to continue in Psalm 119 this morning. If you want to go ahead and open up your Bibles there, we'll be in verses 81 through 88. Again, this is the biggest chapter of the Bible, and it's got a lot of really good uh, things about it, especially when we consider God's Word. We started the series last week, How to Change Your World in Just 20 Minutes a Day, where I'm teaching you about the Bible. I am speaking from the Bible, about the Bible, and throughout the series, I am teaching you at least one way to study the Bible, and that is the devotional Bible study method that is in Rick Warren's Bible Study Methods book. This series has a 40-day challenge attached to it with the hope of helping you to build a habit of spending at least 20 minutes a day over the next 40 days reading and studying your Bible. Last week I shared with you that there are 66 books in seven genres by 35 different authors written over the span of 1,500 years in three different languages. That is our Bible. The Bible is many stories telling one big story, and that story is God rescuing people like you and me. This morning, I'm going to be a bit apologetic, 
Now, I don't mean to say that I'm going to say I'm sorry because it's confusing. In Bible-speaking terms, apologetics isn't saying I'm sorry. According to the Concise Dictionary of the Bible by John Sawyer, the term apologetics is a technical term used to describe speeches or writings produced in defense of one's beliefs and practices. Throughout the history of the church, people have accused it of believing some really odd things, some unusual things. Did you know that the early church was widely accused of practicing cannibalism? Did you know that? We were. It sounds odd. Do we practice cannibalism? <laughs> no. No. <laughs> <We> <laughs> But oftentimes, as the church spread early in, in its history, the charge of cannibalism followed it. Everywhere it went, people said, those Christians practice cannibalism. Why do you think the church was often accused of practicing cannibalism everywhere it went? In the Gospel of John... In fact, you would have read this yesterday if you've been on track with our 40-day challenge of spending 20 minutes a day reading and studying the Bible. John 6 was our reading yesterday. And here's what Jesus says in John chapter 6. So Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life. And I will raise him up on the last day, for my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. Now I know, and you know this isn't cannibalism, but... It can sound like it, especially if you have a new religion coming into town. You've never heard of it. They've caused trouble everywhere they go. You walk by and hear their teaching. You hear that, and you see them drink something and eat something. Logically, you might think, cannibal. Now, we know it foretells the Lord's Supper, and we practice and celebrate that monthly. And it's never been thought of by you probably as cannibalism. But you can see how... In the early church's history, it got confused. The world got confused around it. And when something's confusing, you usually attack it and call it bad things. And so this is what they did to the early church. They called us cannibals. And so the early church would have to defend the belief that Jesus just taught about communion and to explain to the world that we're not eating people. And this is the work of apologetics. So this morning, uh, we're going to look at a few ways the world misunderstands our views of the Bible. I'll practice some apologetics to equip you to also practice apologetics in case you have friends, family, or neighbors who misunderstand our view of the Bible. It should be fun. I'm looking forward to it this morning. But let's first look at Psalm 119, 81 through 88. My soul longs for your salvation. I hope in your word. My eyes long for your promise. I ask, when will you comfort me? For I have become like a wineskin in the smoke, yet I have not forgotten your statutes. How long must your servant endure? When will you judge those who persecute me? The insolent have dug pitfalls for me. They do not live according to your law. All your commandments are sure. They persecute me with falsehood. Help me. They have almost made an end of me on earth. But I have not forsaken your precepts. In your steadfast love, give me life that I may keep the testimonies of your mouth. Would you pray with me? God, thank you for your word. Thank you for this beautiful passage in Psalm 119. We long for your salvation. Our hope is in your word. Help us to see and read and study your words to us. Help us to fall in love deeply with what you say to us. Your commandments are sure. Lord, 
We need You. Help us. In our week that we've had, the week that's ahead of us, we need You. And we thank You for Your Word this morning that we have hope in You. We have hope because of Your words to us. Tell us that You are faithful. Thank You for Your faithfulness. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Life is hard sometimes, isn't it? Life can be very difficult, and I don't know what last week was like for you, and I don't know what next week holds for you, but, but chances are there's going to be hard times ahead. The world can weigh on you. People around you can drag your name through the mud unjustly. The community around us can to destroy us. Life can be hard, but what gives us peace? What gives us hope? here according to the Psalms. This Psalm says it's God's Word, the Bible. The Bible can change your world. Our perspectives can change when we spend time reading and studying the Bible. Our soul is strengthened, especially in our time of weakness, as we study God's words to us. The psalmist at the end of his, is at the end of his rope here in verse 86 where he says, Help me. I don't know if you've been at a place this week where you've just said, help me. That's not an uncommon thing to be at the end of your rope. And where do we find our help? Our help comes from God. And we get to know Him in the pages of His Word. Before we start our defense of some of the things that we believe about the Bible, before we start the practice of apologetics, let's first consider where we believe the Bible came from. If you're following along with the challenge, the passage of the Bible that we're memorizing from last week is a good one. It's in 2 Timothy 3.16. It says, all Scripture is breathed out by God. It is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. So the man of God can be complete, ready for all every good work. As Christians, we believe that the Bible is breathed out by God. The Bible is breathed out by God. And if you remember from Easter, I spent some time pointing us to the creation stories in Genesis chapter 1 and Genesis chapter 2. God created everything by speaking it into existence. As we read and understand what the Bible says about creation, this creation out of nothing, we believe that he spoke it into existence from nothing. Sometimes this is called creation ex nihilo, meaning creation out of nothing. But how did God create man, though? How did he create us? According to Genesis 2-7, the Lord God formed the man from the dust, from the ground, and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And the man became a living creature. I find it very interesting that Paul says to Timothy that the Bible is breathed out by God using this same imagery about how God brought life to man. We believe that the Bible is breathed out by God, and we get this belief from the Bible itself. When we consider how God gave us the Bible, we have this term, inspiration the inspiration of Scripture, the inspiration of the Bible. And according to the Baker Encyclopedia of the Bible, which is a page-turner, by the way, if you want to really get into some reading of the Baker Encyclopedia of the Bible, uh, it's a theological term, this inspiration of Scripture, that, se- that speaks to the influence that God exerted on the writers of Scripture, enabling them to transmit His revelation of Himself in writing. John Frame says it this way in the Lexham Survey of Theology, inspiration is a divine action that creates an identity between human word and a divine word. God did something supernatural when he influenced the human authors of the Bible. God did something supernatural to or through those 35 authors of the Bible, those human authors, to ensure they wrote what he wanted writing, written. 
The Bible was breathed out by God through those 35 different people who wrote it over a span of 1,500 years. God used their different personalities, their different writing styles to help share the story of the Bible. The Bible is many stories telling that one big story, and that story is God rescuing people like you and me. So it's one thing to say that God gave us the Bible. That might be be easy to believe. It's another thing to say that what we have in our Bible today is what God wants us to have or wanted us to have originally. Now remember, the Bible was originally written in three different languages and none of them were English. Some, of the part, some parts of the Bible could be as old as 3,500 years old. It might be reasonable to think that a piece of writing that old, written in different languages over that amount of time, might get adjusted. It might get cre- uh, changed or edited. That is, if we were talking about just any piece of writing. The Bible is not just any piece of writing. The Bible was given to us in the unique way of inspiration. God using human authors, inspiring those authors, doing something supernatural. And we also believe that the Holy Spirit has kept the copying and translating of the Bible pure over time to ensure that we have what God wants us to have in the Bible. Now, I won't get into it too much because many of us watched a documentary last year about how the Holy Spirit has kept the Bible pure in its translation over time. That documentary is called Fragments of Truth, and if you have an hour and 15 minutes and you find that topic interesting, you can watch that on YouTube by going to whiteplains.church slash fragments, and it will take you right to that video. But here's what the Bible says about itself. Remember, human words are always lesser words than what God's word is to us. And so this is what the Bible says about it in 1 Peter 1. Having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth for a sincere brotherly love, love one another earnestly from a pure heart, since you've been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and abiding word of God. For all flesh is like grass, and it's all its glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers, and the flower falls, but the word of the Lord remains forever. And this word is the good news that was preached to you. Peter is quoting Isaiah here, and this is a rather beautiful passage in Isaiah 40 that reminds us, The Word of God, the Bible, will stand forever. Just listen to how Isaiah says this in Isaiah 40, verses 6 through 8. A voice says, cry. And I said, what shall I cry? All flesh is grass, and all its beauty is like the flower of the field. The grass withers, the flower fades. When the breath of the Lord blows on it, Surely the people are grass. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. You and I will come and go. Generations have come and gone, but the word of God, the Bible, has remained. That's what the Bible says about itself. We can trust that what we have in the Bible today is what God wants us to have, even in English even some 3,500 years from some of its beginning. But there are many people who don't believe the Bible. There are other religions and philosophies that are very much at odds with the Bible. So why do others not trust and even attack the Bible? The Bible points us to the cross. This is the storyline of the Bible, pointing us to Jesus' death on the cross, rescuing rescuing us there. Here's what Paul writes to the Corinthian church, and he quotes a little bit of Isaiah also here. For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved by it, 
is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, it pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs and Greeks seek wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to the Jews and folly to Gentiles. But to those who are called both Jews and Gentiles, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. Many authors in the New Testament quote the Old Testament. Peter quoted Isaiah earlier. Paul quotes him here. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and Jesus himself all quote Isaiah. The Old and New Testaments are connected primarily through the book of Isaiah. And Isaiah is a book, a prophecy, foretelling us of Messiah, of Jesus being Christ. But for those who don't believe the Bible, to those who attack the Bible, Paul says Christ crucified is a stumbling block to the Jews and folly is foolishness to everybody else. For those who don't believe the Bible, they object to the Bible. Here's a list of four common objections to the Bible. Maybe you've heard some of these. The Bible is full of contradictions and discrepancies. The Bible is full of violence, genocide, prejudice, and injustice, often commanded by God. And it's been used by Christians to justify more violence and more oppression. The Bible's description of nature and natural history are hopelessly at odds with science. The Bible was written by ancient and primitive people, and has no value to modern people anymore. Have you heard some of those arguments against the Bible? Maybe they've been worded differently, but I got this list from an organization called BioLogos, where according to their website, they are attempting to explore God's Word and God's world to inspire authentic faith for today. Their vision is faith and science working hand in hand And that's a challenging vision because oftentimes we see science and faith being at odds, don't we? But I want to encourage you that they aren't at odds. They are not the polar opposites we may think they are because God is the sole creator of everything, including our understanding of science. God is the God over science, whether scientists recognize that or not. God is the God over you, whether you recognize it or not. God is the God over all things. And science, at its most basic level, is man trying to understand God's word, his world. And God's world, we're told, points us to God. So even if they don't realize it, scientists are studying God as they study science. In science, we're looking to find God through God's world. In faith, we're looking to find God through God's word. BioLogos attempts to merge these two worlds. Let's look at some of the responses to at least one of the common objections in the, to the Bible. I would love to cover more, but I think it's good to go a little deeper in one than try to cover all of them quickly. The objection I want us to look at is the Bible is full of contradictions and discrepancies. A response to this objection is simply to not engage that conversation. It might seem an easy way out, but it, it, it might be an easy way out, but it's a biblical approach. When someone makes an objection to the Bible being full of contradictions and discrepancies, almost always it's an objection out of ignorance meaning they've never read what they're objecting to. They are speaking in a fool's term. They don't know what they're arguing. They're simply repeating what someone else has said. And those objections are somewhat foolish. So not engaging in this objection is biblical. 
Here's what the Proverbs say. Proverbs 26, verses 4 through 5. Answer not a fool according to his folly, lest you be like him yourself. Answer a fool according to his folly, lest he be wise in his own eyes. Engaging in foolish debate based in ignorance is not wise. It never has been. It never will be. However, if you do have someone who is engaging you in conversation and they're seeking to understand, to come out of their ignorance, it is important and it's biblical to be ready to give an answer. Here's what 1 Peter says in 1 Peter chapter 3. But even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you will be blessed. Have no fear of them, nor be troubled, but in your hearts honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect, having a good conscience, so that when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. For it is better to suffer for doing good, if that should be God's will, than for doing evil. A simple, common objection that many people who don't understand the Bible have happens right in the beginning of the Bible, with the order of creation. If you spent time looking at the order of creation, it might not make a lot of sense. A scientifically-minded person is confused, and they may not understand how God could have created light on day one and not have created the sun and stars and moon until day four. Where did the light come from? That's the objection. If there was no sun, no stars, and no moon, how could we have light? Science asks that question. It's a good question to ask. How would you say to someone with that objection, you can trust the Bible when they can't understand the order of creation? This is the work of apologetics. This is hard work because if we, especially if we don't have a handle of the storyline of Scripture, we don't understand the genres, the time frame, the cultures, the languages, the time frame of, of how long it's taken to have some of these stories, the human authors of the Bible. If your objector is coming from a scientific mind, it is helpful to be familiar with their science and use that as the foundation of their objection. Google and ChatGPT can be helpful places for you to begin to understand some of the research and their science. Our engagement in objections should never be to win an argument. When we discuss matters, when we debate things of faith, of the Bible, that Christians hold true, we should never do that to win an argument. But we should do it to glorify God and hopefully bring someone to a saving knowledge of Jesus. We should always follow what Peter says as we give a defense for what we believe. As we debate, as we discuss things of spiritual matters, we do so with gentleness and respect. If you hear Christians or if you hear pastors defending or debating a belief that they hold dear and they try to win arguments and prove you wrong, and they're being rude, and they're being disrespectful to their opponent, they prove they don't understand the Bible. Christians, even in our defense of what we believe, we must be gentle. We must show respect. This is right from 1 Peter chapter 3. We show gentleness, and we show respect when we debate, when we argue. We trust the Holy Spirit to do the convincing. We don't convince with our harsh words or our rudeness. Okay, so how can God create life before he creates sun, stars, or moon? How can he create light before all that? There's two ways that I hope to help answer this objection. The first way is from the world of science. According to science, there is no contradiction of light coming before stars are formed, even today. We understand that light often comes before sun and stars and moons are formed. In fact, if you have someone you're speaking with who is astronomically minded, you can point to them the the scientifically proven concept 
of emission nebulas. They're pretty cool. They light up and they're not stars. It's a gas area and they are nebulas where stars are formed. And because they are emission nebulas, they are emitting light. Um, stars are born when gravitational centers begin to form and collapse, bringing dust and gases together to form that nebula, to form the stars come after that. So before stars are created, emission nebulas have light being emitted. Now this could be a way of answering the objection in Genesis 1 to allow science to help answer how God created light before the sun. Light is often formed before stars. This defense is a modern telling of an ancient argument, an ancient defense. Uh, Basil, a church leader in the mid-300s A.D., made a defense that the essence of the sun was created before the substance of the sun was created. The thing that made the sun was created before the actual sun was created. Another way of answering this objection on how God created light before the sun is more spiritual in matter. Before the creation of anything, we believe, according to the Bible, that God existed. And now, it's unknowable what pre-creation looked like, but as God created the universe, the first thing to come into the newly created universe is the light of Christ. As we believe in the Trinity, we must believe that the Trinity existed as Trinity before creation. In fact, some would say that it's because of the relationship in the Trinity and the love they had for each other that the universe was created, but that's another topic. As creation was created, the first thing to be made known was the light of Christ. There is much in the New Testament that refers to Jesus being the light, and this has been a way that the church has answered this objection as far back as almost the beginning. Tertullian, a church leader in the mid early 200s AD, made this defense. Now, either response you use as you defend your beliefs should draw your objector to the glory and wonder of God. If you walk away with a defeated objector, you've missed the opportunity to defend your belief. It's difficult today to do this, isn't it? Because our culture doesn't know how to discuss things from a differing viewpoint. In many ways, it's very difficult to disagree and still be friendly with each other. But that's the call in 1 Peter chapter 1, or 1 Peter chapter 3, to show gentleness and respect as you defend your belief. As we consider the objections and responses to the Bible like this, I want to encourage you with something from Paul in Romans 12. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. You can trust the Bible. Spending time reading the Bible is the best way to change your world because you will renew your mind. You will grow in wisdom. The point of the Bible is not to win arguments. It's to find salvation, to be re reunited with the God of the Bible. Let me remind us from uh, Psalm 119.81 at the beginning of our passage, my soul longs for your salvation. I hope in your world. I'll invite the worship team to come back. And as they come back up, the biggest and best way to trust in the Bible and to trust in God is for the salvation of your soul. Trust Him today, the very creator of the universe, the maker of heaven and earth, created you. And of all the places and all the times that he could have created you, he's created you for now and for here. And he's created you to know him. 
and to put your trust in him. Will you put your trust in Jesus today? Would you stand with me as we pray? God, we thank you for this time in your word. Thank you for the salvation that your word points us to. How you've created us not to be alone, not to figure things out on our own, but to be renewed in our mind by spending time with you in your word. Help us to find the salvation that our soul longs for. Help us to trust you day in and day out, every day. You are good. We thank you for your goodness. We thank you for Jesus. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.